Um, Eric Byers is the CEO at Adolis Technology. Um, he is absolutely um, recognized as one of the world's leading experts in ICS cybersecurity. Um, he is create, he uh, created the Topino firewall, one of the first kind of uh, industrial control system firewalls I ever got to lay hands on and work with and really start to understand the uh, uniqueness of industrial control system protocols and, and the need for very specific, not just controllers and industrial control system devices, but also specific ICS aware security technologies. And, um, and uh, just, again, one of the most widely deployed industrial control system specific firewalls in the world. So uh, a, a known name to a lot of people in this space. He has led industry efforts and working groups across a wide variety of different uh, areas, uh, provided guidance to governments, large energy companies, uh, testified in Congress, and received uh, ISA's highest honor of excellence in leadership. Um, just uh, one of our most consistently sought after speakers and talks at this summit. So I'm really, really glad you're able to join us today, Eric. Looking forward to your talk. And um, I know others, as they as they heard Eric was coming, they, well, he's really gonna cover SBOM and he's really gonna cover supply chain. So we'll just sort of uh, leave that in his lap. So uh, Eric, we're all, we're all waiting for your uh, presentation. Thank you again for joining us today. Great, thanks very much. It's, uh, it's a real pleasure um, to be here. And um, yeah, I'm pretty excited uh, to be able to talk about supply chain, especially after some of those absolutely great uh, talks that we just uh, saw. Um, and Ron Brash, uh, what you can do with tearing things apart for your supply chain was pretty amazing. Um, but uh, yeah, some really, really good uh, great talks. So I'm going to dig into one part of supply chain. I'm not going to cover the whole supply chain because what you saw with Ron Brash's talk is that once you can find out what's under underneath the surface, what's hidden in there, uh, you can do both good and bad. And uh, Ron definitely showed um, the evil that people could do um, by doing teardowns. Um, but there's no point in trying to uh, stick our head into the sand like an ostrich and pretend that you can't uh, that, that if I can't see what's in those uh, in that firm or if I can't see what's in that software, the bad guys won't. We need to find that, um, you know, a security by obscurity is no defense. So I really, really wanted to talk about how we can get uh, into the components and be able to use that in a way that will make our systems more secure. And so I'm going to be talking lots about supply chain. And of course, uh, unless you have been firmly with your head in the sand, uh, supply chain is pretty big topic these days. Uh, lots and lots and lots of stories uh, out there. The big one, of course, being solar winds. Um, and the reality is supply chain attacks are up 340% um, according to Sonotype, and I have every reason to believe them. Um, you know, and the reason is, is like ransomware, it's terrific return on investment for a bad guy. So we're only going one way with supply chain attacks and that's there gonna be more of them. So with that bad news, um, I, I wanna talk particularly about supply chain attacks in our world, uh, in the ICS world. Um, and of course, maybe the original supply chain attack was Stuxnet where they stole digital certificates um, and use those from a legitimate supplier to be able to wrapper and uh, make the Stuxnet code look like it was a legitimate software. So there, you guys can all go get a beer now that we've said the word Stuxnet. Um, Stuxnet wasn't what got me excited about supply chain issues in uh, our space though, in the industrial space. It was really a dragonfly in 2014 um, when Joel Langle actually brought it over to me and said, you gotta look at this. Um, this is a problem. Um, and so a bunch of you have heard the story of Dragonfly, but for those who haven't, I'm just going to go over Dragonfly really quickly. Um, it starts out with a, a, a lot of um, uh, initial reconnaissance by the attackers, um, a lot of watering hole attacks. But then um, in January of 2004, they started going after ICS vendors and they went after three mid-tier ICS vendors um, in Europe and they replaced the legitimate software on their download sites with trojanized versions that contained the malware Habix. Now in our industry, we have done well to teach our technicians um, to patch early and patch often. And, and sure enough, with that new software sitting up on those vendors' websites, the technicians started downloading it. 
Um, the vendor that I ended up working uh, um, extensively with had Trojanized software up for three weeks. Um, there were uh, almost 300 downloads by technicians. And you can bet that if somebody's downloading uh, industrial software, they're not using it for their home computer, they're putting it into their facility. And so that was probably 300 industrial facilities, maybe more if you're a manager or technician that's mo monitoring multiple facilities. Um, and so pretty good return on investments. And as soon as this stuff was activated inside an industrial facility, just like solar winds, it calls home. Um, and so now these attackers have um, a deep footprint uh, inside the industrial facilities with the ability to do uh, scanning for Modbus, scanning for Ethernet IP, OPC analysis, lots of nice Swiss Army uh, toolkits sitting in your industrial facility. So the real sad part and the part that really frustrated me, uh, me in this whole thing as I looked at it, at the time I was selling firewalls. And there was nothing I could do with a firewall to stop this because the technicians were determined to take uh, the software in and patch the system. Uh, that's what we've taught them to do. Make sure you patch. Oh, wait a second. Our antivirus is saying that's bad software. No, no, I got it straight from the vendor's website. Oh, our um, whitelist says that that's bad software. Nope, uh, must be a mistake. So the, the fact that they were getting the software from the vendor that really, really would drive behaviors that uh, benefited the attackers. And that's the whole story around supply chain attacks. Um, there are some trivial ones out there that are not even hardly worth mentioning, except they work. Uh, let's go take um, standard ransomware, wrap it, uh, rename it as allenbradleyupload.zip and start putting it up on forums. Um, not very sophisticated, but pretty darn effective. So it ranges from highly, uh, uh, well designed to really like amateur hour, but still effective. Um, all of this is taking advantage of the fact that we trust our vendors. We have to trust our vendors. And ICS is probably uniquely vulnerable compared to IT. Um, we have a lot of ingredients that go into our ICS software stew and they come from a lot of different suppliers. And as a result, all of those suppliers in the chain basically present an opportunity for an attacker to inject um, malware or malicious code into that chain. Um, so how are we gonna fix this? What are we going to do to prevent um, another Dragonfly or Stuxnet or solar winds in our space? And um, there's been some really, really good papers on this and white paper that I'd recommend is the Atlantic Council's recommendations. Um, I'll give you some details where to find this later. But um, they have a series of recommendations on what we need to do uh, as an industry, not just our industry, but overall in the software industry uh, to secure the software supply chain. And here are uh, five points that they mention. Um, basically develop a software supply chain overlay to the NIST standards, um, then actually do something about it and don't sit around and talk about it. Uh, then bring it to cover the cloud as well, um, which uh, you just heard David talking about. That's uh, you know, life, we're going to have to deal with cloud as well. Uh, and then very important here, and, and what I want to talk about and focus on today, integrate uh, the software bill of material standards. And I'll talk about those in a second. And then build us some tools. Um, and that's what I want to focus on, the tools and what software bill of materials are. So here's a software bill of materials. It's effectively a nested list, an inventory of what makes up software. So think of it as the ingredients list for any software package. You can see a uh, start of a software uh, bill of materials breakdown uh, on the side for some GE software there on the right hand side of this picture. And there's a number of standardized formats for um, software bill of materials, uh, SPDX, Cyclone DX, uh, SWID are all standardized um, formats for recording software bill of materials. Um, without the software bill of materials, I have to, I, I strongly believe now that vulnerability management among another, a number of other things is pretty much broken. Um, we need to know the components in order to need the vulnerabilities. And let me, uh, give you a specific example. And the reason is, is because when you go hunt the CVE database, they 
the entries in the database typically reflect the component manufacturer, not the person that you bought the software off of. And this is really important in our space. So if there's a vulnerability in product X and uh, your supplier uses product X deep in its supply chain, that's not gonna show up in the national vulnerability database when you go searching, if you've got PLCX. Um, let me give you an example um, here. So here's a vulnerability here uh, from a, about a year and a half ago uh, with around Wind River VX Works. They've got a buffer overflow in their TCP components. Okay, great. Now, the problem with this is, is we can dig into this and we can look at the advisory and we can see a bunch of companies that are actually mentioned by name. All right, great. Okay, so if I'm a Siemens user, if I'm a SonicWall user, F5, and obviously Wind River who owns VxWorks, um, then maybe I need to be uh, heads up. But, and this is the difficult part, if you actually go out to the specific vendors, and I'm gonna pick on one right now, Rockwell Automation, those uh, vendors are actually announcing they've got that vulnerability too, but you won't find it by looking in the CVE databases. You have to go out and look at the uh, PDFs produced by every single vendor uh, that you use in your facility. That's simply not very efficient. In fact, it's terrible. Um, and it gets worse. We did a study of one major uh, ICS vendors, one of the big five. 46% um, of their uh, vulnerabilities have no listed CVE. So you can go hunt the CVE database till the cows come home. You are not going to get vulnerabilities link back to the products and PLCs you're using on the plant floor unless you actually go and look at the vendor's website. And that is gonna be digging through PDFs. Um, and so that's where things start to fall apart. And that's why we need uh, a software bill of materials in order to allow us to go and do proper lookups for our vulnerabilities. That's one of the reasons, there's a bunch. Um, now, in a perfect world, um, everybody would supply software bill of materials based on their source code right out of development. Um, and that's, that's, that's nice, but we've got uh, a problem in our space. Source codes may not be available um, either because the vendor doesn't have it or it's some sort of third party. I mean, you take a major vendor, uh, then they will know who they buy software from to build their product, but they don't know who their suppliers, suppliers, suppliers are. Uh, and we saw this all the time at Tofino. Um, we were uh, selling to uh, major suppliers uh, and we were using other suppliers and they were using other suppliers. And often um, the chain on software would be five or six layers down. So in order to build it all out of source code, we simply didn't see that source code. And of course, um, there's a lot of third-party compiled libraries in our space. Um, there's a lot of legacy code. There's a lot of legacy systems. Um, so we um, like using what we call derived SBOMs. Basically build your SBOMs from the binaries you're about to load rather than um, hoping and waiting for a source code SBOM. Again, source code SBOMs, they're cool if you can get them, but you can't get them. So it's not about waiting, it's about doing something today. Um, now it turns out there's just a wealth of data in compiled code. And Ron just showed you in his talk about how he digs into compiled code. He was using our tools to get started and basically lay it out. But let me give you a specific example. Okay, I'm looking at a package here um, that is from a major supplier of wind turbine management systems. And if I just open it up using a standard expansion tool, uh, you know, I can see that there's a bunch of components in here and some of those start to give me some really nice clues and there's something called vice. Okay, that's a packaging tool that's pretty ancient, but uh, if we can tear that apart, um, let's tear what, uh, what is in here in main uh, and open up uh, now that we know vice is being used, uh, we can then uh, discover all sorts of cool things like, hey, wow, look, this package actually is designed to install VX Works. Okay, all right, that's pretty cool. Now we know that VX Works is a supplier to uh, this um, uh, ICS vendor. Um, that's very handy. Also, the boot ROM will tell you a ton of things as 
uh, Ron showed you, we can uh, dig into that boot room and actually discover a lot more cool things in here. Um, for example, the ELF header points out that this is going to be running on a PowerPC. Um, there's tons and tons of data in here. And with that, if we just keep tearing down like Ron did, um, and if we can do this in an automated fashion, we can build really effective SBOMs. But SBOMs are only so good. They're not the, the beginning and the end of it. Um, we have to be able to uh, enrich them. Let me explain what I mean. If I go to the store and I pick up a, say a can of soup and I look at the ingredients, that ingredients is the S-bomb. All right, that's a soup bill of materials. But um, if I don't know what those words on that label mean, for example, it says palm oil on it. Is palm oil good for me or bad for me? And, and if I don't have the attributes and the enrichment around those ingredients. And if I don't understand those ingredients, then I can have any words I want in my software bill of materials. So what we have to do is build the ingredients list and then enrich it. Okay, so we take our uh, vendor binaries and ideally this is something I really hope the vendors do. And, and I'm, I'll talk more about that in a bit, but I really think this is ideally done at the, at the vendor facility, but it can be done externally. It can be done by an asset owner as well. Um, you run it through an SBOM agent to build your bill of materials, and then you start tearing apart those bill of materials and start to look at how much you trust every component. And the very first thing you want to do is, do I think all the components in here came from a reputable supplier? And this is where we start to pick up things like uh, the uh, Stuxnet attack or the uh, attacks that we saw from... Uh, the dragonfly attacks. We're not looking for the reputation of the overall package. We're really trying to understand uh, the reputation of the components. That can't. That is not perfect because a lot of stuff isn't signed. Um, but by doing that carefully, you can be able to determine. And I'll show you in a minute a lot of information about the components in there. Okay, and that's where I actually initially only planned to stop this whole project, but. Um, I realized that, hey, while I've got that package apart and I'm out looking, you might as well start going hunting to the National Vulnerability Database and NSLL and other third-party really good analysis tool companies like Refirm Labs. And you should be mining all the vendors' websites and databases as well and aggregating that up for all those components. And while we're at it, we might as well do it uh, for all the components and see if there's any malware associations. There's some really cool tools out there. Virus Total, you guys have probably seen for uh, basically getting an aggregated response from uh, dozens and dozens of uh, antivirus tools and people like Nextron who have outstanding uh, Yara rule list for detecting uh, malware in, in software components. Then you bundle that all together and you stuff it out on API and you can either use that for a web interface or you can use it as an API access, which is what Ron does. So that's what I mean by SBOM enrichment. Just getting the names on the label is not good enough. You have to be able to then make decisions. This, by the way, is another uh, fun part of the talk, but what you'll discover really quickly when you look at software bill of materials is the names are uh, misery uh, because um, people buy companies, they change names. You know, are you, is that software bill of materials says, um, Alan Bradley, well, most of you guys now know that Alan Bradley is owned by Rockwell. Um, how do you associate those two to make sure you're doing the right lookups? You know, that you should be going, it says Alan Bradley software. How do you know you go to the Rockwell website and look in the National Vulnerability Database for Rockwell? So there's a lot of machine learning uh, to be able to clean up that data. Which brings me to my next point. What do you need to do in order to actually make SBOMs functional for our industry? Well, first of all, that binary decomposition, because um, you need to be able to tear those packages apart. And to follow on on David's talk about cloud, it's going to be cloudy. Uh, you have to use the cloud at some point because all the databases that are out there are cloud-based, whether it's the vendor's databases, whether it's the national vulnerability database, you want to go and get that information from a cloud source. Um, you're not gonna be able to download all of those and, and keep them locally. As I mentioned, you're going to end up using a lot of machine learning for aggregating multiple databases and doing correlation. What a uh, good example, if anybody of you have ever used the GFNUC 
um, uh, 9020s or um, uh, RX uh, 3i PLCs. If you go and search for vulnerabilities in the National Vulnerability Database, you better be looking for Emerson. If you go to uh, ICS CERT, you better be looking for GE. So that kind of correlation uh, can be done manually, and but it's miserable. Uh, this is where machine learning algorithms are essential. And then finally, you really need to use database technologies known as graph database to understand those relationships. And I'll give you some examples in a second on why that's so important, um, because you need to be able to understand the relationships between different suppliers um, up to different uh, OEMs and vendors. So let me give you one example of using SBOMs to find vulnerabilities. Ron probably gave you an even better example when he showed how he used the SBOM capability to tear down uh, a product and find vulnerabilities in it. But here's a very simple um, one. This is a GE product called Reason Manager. Uh, nothing particularly wrong about this product. Uh, it's, it's a good product, except uh, there is a component in there called IC Sharp. Okay, all right, so what? Well, uh, if we dig in um, using an, uh, an analysis tool, we can see uh, a bunch of data that's kind of useful. And that data is useful because I can use that, stuff that into machine learning algorithms and then go a hunting. And sure enough, if I go hunting based on the file version, the company name, product name, stuff like that, I start to get hits. And sure, there's a hit there, uh, and that's really, really useful. Now we can say that there's a vulnerability or a high probability of a vulnerability um, from a third party buried inside this overall package. Um, but remember those trees I talked about, the, the graph database? Okay, where else is it found? Okay, we can start looking back using the graph database to see, hey, these are other packages. Now these other packages here, I've uh, hidden them because um, I'm still talking to the vendor that has these packages. So, but you can understand the type of capability. This is particularly um, useful for anybody trying to do asset management and trying to understand uh, what vulnerabilities are really exposed in their assets, but also all the vendors. You know, this is the type of service that is really, really helpful for a vendor when they suddenly realize, hey, uh, we've been using this supplier and that supplier uh, is called Trek and Trek is in the news because it's got vulnerabilities in it. Where is that in our entire product line? Um, now, that's bad news, but you can also use it for good news. And this is, again, where the trees come in. Okay, so often you'll find um, binaries floating around plants. This one here, it's uh, binary. Some of you guys will recognize where it's came from um, because of the part number, but there's no header on it. There's no signing on it. It's almost impossible. So if a technician's about to load this into a PLC, are they really going to be able to check it? And the fact is, is if we can use that tree search again, we can see that it was actually part of a larger package that was distributed by Rockwell and signed by Rockwell. So that allows us to give uh, confidence to components that are free floating on the plant floor. Um, contrast this to um, an almost identical package, uh, which was given to me by um, a university. Uh, and it's actually a modified uh, trojanized version of a binary. And we don't trust this one to be legitimate because we've never seen it distributed by Rockwell. So we can immediately say this thing probably smells. Uh, and, and that's the really important thing about these SBOMs. They can be used to, um, both to detect the vulnerabilities and detect potential malware um, buried deep inside a package. But it's also really, really useful for um, dealing with the whole question of, oh, I've got a component now that's free floating on my plant floor or on it that's been installed in a system. Uh, is it legitimate or is it a problem? So, you know, I hope you all understand by now why I'm so passionate about SBOMs. But for the ICS vendors, I think it is super useful to help them track their dependencies and component based issues across any of their shipping products manage their third party issues, manage uh, the reliability of their suppliers and basically help their customers validate uh, software and meet regulatory requirements. Um, and by regulatory requirements, a good example is uh, SIP 13, which I know any of you in the power industry are currently struggling with. So if you can um, get a good SBOM build 
uh, from your suppliers, it just makes your life easier. And for your suppliers, that just makes your life easier if you're not having to fill out more paperwork and you can say, here's the SPOM, Mr. Customer. Um, I, I've helped you comply with, their, with SIP 13. For asset owners, it really is critical to try and um, prioritize your vulnerabilities and your risks for your deployed systems um, and not just a uh, hunt. So it allows you to locate those subcomponents um, that are high risk and be able to um, manage your triage plans. And ditto for subcomponents that are supplied by prohibited third parties. Um, we all know that some third parties and nations are not allowed into certain systems. So it's really good to be able to go find this. And if you're a security analyst um, doing work like Ron, then it's really, really useful for your threat hunting and for your incident response work and for your teardowns. <clears throat> um, it's really interesting. Our industry is a little bit behind on SBOMs. I listened to a really good talk by Snow Yule, who's former chief security scientist at Bank of America. And uh, this is just right out of his slide deck. Um, and he said, terms and conditions should make it explicitly clear that the SBOM is a best practice intended to reduce risk to the buyer. And then he goes, uh, the lack of a SBOM transfers risk from the software manufacturer to the buyer, thus the buyer should be appropriately compensated for that transfer of risk. So what Sunul is saying here is um, without SBOMs, uh, the end user is at risk and the, uh, the risk is serious and should be compensated for. Or even better from a security point of view, um, I truly believe that um, we need to start providing the SBOMs. So to wrap this up, um, I, I believe that uh, I can show you that SBOMs can be generated from compiled code if you know how to look there. Um, <coughs> we really need these graph database techniques to really <coughs> manage that, um, manage all that forest of components. And then you need machine learning and AI techniques to be able to, to know that you should be looking for G in one database and, and Emerson in the other database, you should be looking for Alan Bradley in this database, and you should be looking for Rockwell in that database, all for the same product. So that's absolutely critical. <clears throat> um, for all you ICS end users out there, um, start asking for your SBOMs. Um, I believe it is something you need to be able to manage your systems, either directly or by um, your uh, um, platform providers, your security platform providers, um, like Verve and Dragos. Um, get the SBOMs to them so they can use it to properly manage your products on the plant floor. And then all you ICS vendors who happen to be on the, um, if you want to use the, our derived SBOM builders, give me a call. I, I'm quite happy to share a lot of this. Um, this is, uh, I'm pretty excited about what we've done and how we do this. So uh, if you um, want to look at this and play with this, yeah, give me a shout. Um, if you want to learn more, uh, there's a couple of really good papers out there. The Atlantic Council, I mentioned this. Uh, Google Atlantic Council Breaking Trust, or I'll throw the links uh, onto the Slack um, later. Um, and then also ARC put a really good paper out called Taking Control of Your uh, ICS IoT and uh, IIoT Software Supply Chain Security Risks. Both of those are available at no cost as a download. And um, they'll really give you a background on the use of SBOMs and why it's so important. So at that point, I'm going to hand this back to Tim and maybe we can do some Q&A. Of course, we have, uh, we have five minutes. So uh, I'll go through fast questions first. Um, there's a number that are in the hallway chat that will be waiting your attention. There's some people wondering uh, if I want to try to screw with you and screw with your process, how would you detect it if I made this small little change to a trusted file? You can, uh, you can walk through some of that with them. But on, uh, for number one question that's been repeated a few times, legacy software or systems that are out of support, um, how do you approach that? Well, that's why I didn't go to source code is <laughs> because that's exactly the problem is <laughs> that most, I mean, I just was talking to uh, a large um, OEM the other day who has uh, over a hundred thousand devices deployed and has lost the source code. Um, no blame here. It was a bunch of mergers and acquisitions and the source codes uh, headed to the hills. Uh, there are some source codes. So absolutely the whole point here is 
can you find the binary? Can you find the installer? Can you find you know, what you actually have on the plant floor? Then you can get an SBOM out of it. And, and I really believe it's the problem we have to solve today um, is generating SBOMs out of the software you are using, not, not the source code. Got it. Um, can you talk a little bit about the relationships and kind of uh, with the vendors that you have in regards to as you're sort of doing this full analysis and full discovery and almost an ancestry.com for the software that we're bringing into our system, you just what does your relationship look like with vendors? Because uh, I would imagine there's to some degree some uh, some concern and other degree kind of an open open hug and an open embrace because you're there to help solve the problem for their customers. Yeah, I mean, we've had some absolutely terrific vendors. Um, I'll call out Brian Owen and the guys at OSI Soft. Um, back when we were just a crazy Nash, um, DHS project, they were giving us software samples and saying, try this, try this, try this. Um, and it's been super useful for them, um, for them to be able to find the issues before the bad guys find it. I mean, again, I think this goes back to the uh, ostrich in the sand. What we're wanting to do with vendors is say, hey, we'll give you the tools to find the problems before somebody else finds them for you. Um, as uh, you know, at Tofino, I loved it when people would bring me vulnerabilities to me and not to Black Hat. Um, sure. You know, so that was our goal is to really empower the vendors to be able to understand their products um, because it's not just their development team, it's, it's all their suppliers. So understand what they actually ship to their customers and give them the tools to do that and then manage that. Um, I'll give you another example. You know, we do these callouts to Virus Total um, and other uh, and, uh, uh, malware uh, detection services. Um, a lot of the time, what we find is false positives. Now, this is something Brian Owen actually got us doing. Is this is super useful for their support desk because hey, this one component when installed is going to trigger the following antivirus. It's a false positive. I can guarantee it. Um, but that is useful for Brian to be able to go back to his support desk and say, when somebody calls up and says that their antivirus triggered on this package, uh, we can explain why here it is. But he, he gets to see that in advance, not after the phone, de phone at the support desk fell off the hook from so many calls. Sure. All right, last question. I'll try to make this as fast as possible. On uh, lots of mention kind of to NERC SIP, industry that is dealing with NERC SIP specifically, they see the supply chain risk management steps like vendor access management, vendor breach notification, vulnerability disclosure. They see the efforts in SIP 10 kind of for um, verification of identity of software sources, clearly a, an alignment here and verifying um, integrity of the software obtained, an absolute alignment. They see those things as a first step forward. Other industries see what's been done and they see a step forward that they should be pursuing to where we're at now. If, if you start looking down the road for the next step and the next step, um, what do you think comes next for SIP 13 and SIP 10 beyond what they currently have? Oh, absolutely. Um, so, you know, one of the challenges that I think everybody's facing out there right now is, um, you know, tools like us, tools like generate an awful lot of vulnerabilities. Um, by digging into the package. Uh, but a lot of those, I'd say 90% of them are false positives, honestly. So now what we have to do is start to triage the noise uh, and start to really focus on what matters. Um, so that's one of the things the AI guys are doing on my team right now is, okay, all right, uh, first of all, can we find every possible indicator? And then second, uh, which ones are really the ones that are, are, are at risk because they're actually A, exploitable in your package um, and B, uh, there are exploits in the field. And so that's where it's, you know, th there, there's something going on in the wild. Um, and so that's, I think, where we're going to go is, is not just saying I've got a vulnerability, but I've got a vulnerability that is um, causing a high risk to my operations. And, and that's where we'll go over the next three to four years. I'm glad, I'm glad you went that way. I think that's what the sector would really like to see kind of a uh risk prioritization tied into your patching process and tied into uh, validating and authenticating and really seeing that as our next step forward. So we can start doing the good things we're doing now, but doing them better and more effectively. Um, managing our resources as, as much yep. as we can. Thank I, you again, I, sir. I really yep. appreciate it.